I expect a lot of you will know Dr. Hannah Fry. She's always a popular figure in number five videos, and she's also been here on the podcast before talking about her life and research. But what you might not know is that in 2018, she hosted a special program on the BBC all about pandemics. The show told us of a looming crisis. It even foretold a spiky looking flu virus that would mutate, start in Southeast Asia, and spread through the world with astonishing speed and devastating effect. It would take lives and alter our way of life. It wasn't a matter of if, but when. Two years later, and unfortunately the BBC and Hannah have been making, well, a sequel of sorts, and this time, it's for real. Today, Hannah's sharing some of her thoughts about the current pandemic and why innocent mathematicians will probably end up getting some of the blame. Hannah, last week I had hoped to be in London filming a number file <laughs> video with you, and instead I'm stuck at home and I believe you're sitting in a car. <laughs> this is what our lives have become. <laughs> Tell me why you're in a car. Well... <laughs> Um, because my children are, well, they're making my life extremely difficult. I mean, they're very <laughs> lovely. And I think in a lot of ways, I'm very lucky that uh, lockdown is made easier by their joyful laughter. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's simultaneously made much more difficult by their unjoyful screaming. <laughs> they don't appreciate studio discipline. They just don't, they don't have any no. respect. They don't have any respect for this kind of this kind of output, Brady, and and you know. So the car has become like your home office, has it? Yeah, I know. It's so so pathetic. But every morning, I'm like packing my rucksack, uh, putting in my little packed lunch, putting in my little drink, yeah. getting my coffee and my takeaway cup, and off I go to the car. So um, thus far, I've been doing sort of four to six hour shifts, but now it's getting quite warm and the car's really hot. So yeah. um, I think I need a different. Sort Solution. I can hear loads of birds in the background too. It sounds quite lovely in some ways. I know. You know, I am actually in London. So uh, I think yeah. just um, they're normally drowned out by the sound of traffic. It's all right. No, I'm definitely in a lot better position than a lot of people, I think, during lockdown. So I'm feeling quite fortunate and grateful to even have a car to be able to go and sit in. So Hannah, a few weeks ago, before things got really serious here in the UK, I watched the Hollywood movie contagion. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people have been watching that and there's and a lot of people are watching it thinking oh this is so prescient there's so much sort of I told you so about it. Mm -hmm. Well about an hour and a half ago <laughs> I watched another film called Contagion that was made by BBC4 a great team of people mm -hmm. you you are the presenter of it. I certainly am. It was broadcast in 2018 and that is crazy prescient like it's almost like a joke yeah. how much everything in that documentary and all the things you talked about have kind of are being exactly duplicated now. It's quite spooky, isn't it? Before we talk about it, for people who haven't seen the 2018 <laughs> film that you guys made on BBC4, can you give like an executive summary of it so people sort of get an idea what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, the thing is, is that Everyone knew that something like this was coming. Everyone knew that something like this wasn't just, it was inevitable, essentially. Hmm. And we knew that when it finally came, we needed to be as prepared as possible. You only get one shot at this. You, you don't get to rerun it and try and do a better job the second time. You only get one shot at it. So we needed to be as prepared as possible. And part of being prepared is having mathematical models that will accurately tell you what will change if you apply some kind of intervention like shutting down the schools or, you know, telling people to stay at home, that kind of thing. Hmm. The problem is, is that those, those mathematical models, they're completely based on our understanding of how people move around, how people come into contact with one another, how often people come into contact with one another. And the best possible data that we had at that point in time, in 2017, 2018, when we did this programme, the best data we had for how people move around in the country was a paper survey that was conducted in 2006, hmm. where they asked a thousand people, oh, how many people do you reckon you've been in contact with recently? Which is just, given that everyone's carrying mobile phones, is like the, the maddest, maddest uh, gap in our, in our understanding of people. So the whole idea behind this programme was that we'd asked the public to take part in this citizen science experiment where they download an app on their phones they'd let us track them for 24 hours and we'd run a simulation essentially 
of what would happen if a flu-like virus hit the UK hmm. and what that would mean and how fast it was spread and how many people would end up being sick because of it. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't really expect it to be two years later, but here we are. I might even sneakily play a few clips from it mm. just to give people an indication of how, like, all these things you're saying about, you know, it's obviously, you know, it's not a matter of if but when and it's, you know, they're even saying it's going to come from Southeast Asia. Mm. This is what's going to happen. This is what it's going to look like. This is what people are going to have to do. And it's like part of me thought, did they recut this or re-edit no, this? No, like, no. I think the only thing about it, though, we're, we're quite jolly about the whole thing during the programme. Yes, yeah. Like, it's quite playful. So I remember doing, you know, at the time when we get people to download the app, I got loads of, like, messages from people who were sort of playing along and it was like this big game. Yeah. I got this one message from someone who was like, oh, just downloaded the app and, like, went and infected half of Sheffield Shopping Centre, lol. Yeah. I think that you really, yeah, when you watch, if you do watch it back, there's that innocent tone of it that it is all this big game. Um, yeah. And it really isn't. With the help of thousands of volunteers, we are about to simulate the outbreak of a fatal contagion throughout the UK. That might seem like a funny thing to want to do, but if I can succeed, this will save lives when, not if, a real pandemic hits. The UK government puts pandemic flu at the top of its risk register. The reason for that is it will happen. There will be another pandemic. When you were, like, reading some of those script lines or delivering some of those script lines, like, did you seriously think it was as serious as what you were saying? Because it's almost like, like, you know, like you said, like two years later, it's all happening for real. Yeah. I think the big surprise about this one, it's not like these haven't happened before. You know, this when we filmed it two years ago, SARS and MERS are, were in recent memory. Swine flu, of course, as well, a very recent, um, hmm. you know, Ebola too. It's not like there weren't recent examples of this this exact thing happening. I think the thing that's been surprising about this one isn't so much that the virus jumped from, uh, you know, jumped from a different species into humans. That that step was is almost you know, it's inevitable, really. It's, it's a random act of nature, but it will happen It will happen again. Mm. This is not the last time it's going to happen. Mm. I think what's been surprising about this one is that it's sort of somewhere in the middle. So SARS and MERS were very, very deadly, but they also were... Everyone who got sick got symptoms. And so actually it was comparatively quite easy to contain. You could spot where people were sick. You could isolate them. You could do contact tracing. Mm. You could draw a ring around it, essentially, and lock it down. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have something like flu, uh, which is, you know, I mean, you can't really stop flu at all. I think the thing about this this virus is that in a lot of ways, it, it's just on that cusp of being able to stop it. You're... you're you're, it, it, it's, it just about has enough, uh, you know, symptomatic cases that you feel like you can stop it. But I think, you know, actually it's, it's, it's proving to be really slippery. I think you cannot treat this in the same way as you can with sort of SARS, MERS and Ebola. I think it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's frustratingly in the middle, really, where it feels like you can just about contain it, but perhaps it's always going to slip through your fingers. Do you think that's why one thing that seems to be kind of missing from your 2018 film is the incredible importance that seems to have arisen now of testing to get the data because you, you said like with those other ones you almost didn't need to test if the person was really really sick mm. you knew you knew they had it and if they weren't sick well they probably didn't whereas because we're in this gray area with uh, the coronavirus testing has become this thing that everybody wants and you, you never really talked about testing in the in the 2018 special like it was sort of no we didn't you're you right know. you're right we didn't yeah. I think yeah there is this pressure on testing at the moment I mean I kind of think I'm sort of I, I want to be very optimistic because a lot of people are looking at testing as the sort of green shoots of hope for all of this, for, for how to get us out of lockdown. Hmm. That If you can have tests across the country where everyone can test themselves on a regular basis, can work out whether they have immunity or, you know, have had the virus or are currently sick with the virus. And then you can allow people who, who are OK to go out and so on and so on and so on. I think, you know, that's that's one of the things that people are really looking forward to. I'm just a bit concerned 
about that as an approach, not only for the biological reasons and the practical reasons of getting those tests manufactured and, and out, you know, as quickly as you can, much more for a mathematical reason, which is that this is really where false negatives become a massive problem. Right. Right. So one of the tests um, that I've been looking at recently for another uh, program with the BBC is a home test that's 90% accurate. And that sounds like it's really positive. That sounds pretty positive. 90% accurate sounds amazing. Hmm. Problem with that, it's like the classic story about picking up on on breast cancer diagnosis, which is that if you have a test that's 90% accurate and the test says that you do not have the virus the chances that you do not have the virus are not 90%. Like that's the wrong way to interpret those numbers. We did this actually, um, Matt Parker and I did this during the Christmas lectures Mm -hmm. just to illustrate this really counterintuitive nature of false positives and false negatives when all you have to go on is accuracy rates. And just, it all depends on how common it is in the population. Just the numbers, the numbers don't make it good intuitive sense. But the thing is, is that if you are missing, if you, there's this strange asymmetry with this virus, right? Mm. Which is that if you even have one person in your, in the country who is wandering around with the virus and doesn't know that they have it, we effectively have to treat everyone in the country as though they are infected. Right. And so unless you have a test that is 100% accurate, you will still have this virus that's circulating. And everyone's taken the test. <laughs> and everyone's taking the test. Yeah. I mean, also, yeah. not being funny, right? This test, the one that's 90% accurate, requires a nasal swab, right? I don't know if you've ever had a nasal swab, mm. but it's not a pleasant experience. I read about it. It looks like you've got to stick the thing right back into your brain. Yeah, they, like, I mean, pretty much, right? And with there yeah. are some uh, instances of this in hospitals where nurses, you know, perfectly well-trained nurses are taking nasal swabs and they're getting 40% false negatives because they're just not managing to get a, enough of the, the correct uh, molecules and particles and whatever that you need yeah. for these tests. And then you're expecting people to do this to themselves at home. I mean, it's, there's no way that you're not going to get cases slip through the net. Yeah. And I think that that's okay. I mean, I still think that there's value in all of this stuff in slowing down the spread. I just, right now, I can't see that we can we can crush this thing. I think we can slow it down, certainly. But I think that unless we get very good at something or unless a vaccine comes along very, very quickly, I think that all of the really positive things on the horizon will only take us so far in slowing it down. Hannah, another thing about the 2018 special, I'm not going to sit here and pick holes in it because, as I said, it was it was amazingly predictive. <laughs> but You can, Brady, it's okay. You can. <laughs> throughout the special, uh, one of the things that is portrayed as, as that possible silver bullet is vaccines. You're, you, there's almost a very hopeful tone about vaccines. It, it, it is tempered by the timeframes involved, but you're always talking about if we vaccinate these people, everything will be all right, or if we develop this vaccine in four months, this will be all right. But it seems like now that the reality has happened, vaccines seems a long way off and seems not a big part of the discussion at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's, uh, some people have latched onto this idea of a 12-month timescale. I just, I, I don't know. Ebola took five years, right? <sighs> I don't know. I just, I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm just bit. You've maybe you've caught me on a particularly <laughs> depressive day. Yeah. But I, I just don't know if I don't know if it's likely enough for us to 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 think that it's going to come in and save us. Even with like all the world's sort of resources. Yeah, I mean, and that's a really good point. That is a really good point. That it's not just like you've got one research lab in you know in in somewhere in Britain looking into this. You have a huge monumental effort from all of the world scientists. And I think that actually the the pace of scientific change that we've seen in even the last two months is something that, I mean, I've never, I've never witnessed it before. You know, people, people publishing preprint papers on archives, you know, online and then getting comments and uh, from, from all people all around the world and then incorporating those comments into their papers, you know, before it even goes through this, this normally snail's pace peer review process, I think has been really, really exciting. So, OK, maybe I'm maybe I'm being a bit too pessimistic. I, th- I think I think it's also worth adding, though, that, you know, Western countries don't get to jump the queue in this. And even if a vaccine pops up, in an extremely optimistic way, even if a vaccine pops up, you've still got to manuf- manufacture enough of it. I mean, there are, mm. what, 7 billion people in the world? And I don't think that we get to just jump the queue. In a very morbid way, this feels like a little 
golden era for mathematicians. <laughs> like, it, like it's strange, isn't it? Suddenly, like, mathematicians are, like, in a practical way being treated really important and being being listened to. <laughs> Yeah, is that a fair comment? True. Well, no, I think it is. Having mathematicians on the front page of the newspapers regularly is pretty extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. I did think that, actually. Like, uh, the Today programme asked me to go on a couple of weeks ago. I was, I don't know, for, the Today programme could be a bit of a stressful thing. Uh, yeah. For various reasons, it can be quite a stressful thing. And I was, like, tempted to say no. And then I was talking to my husband about it, and he was like, you spend your entire life going on about how important maths is and how fundamental it is to the way that we make decisions and our understanding of the world. And here is the number one example of all time ever of how important maths is. If you don't go on and talk about it, then like you can't really, you know, it sort of goes against everything you stand for, which I think is true, which I think is true. So I went on anyway. All right. How did it go, all right? It was very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we hear about this SIR model. And it seems to have these three things, as I understand. I've made a couple of videos about it already. Mm, yeah, I've seen them. Amazing. Who's got it? Who hasn't got it? Mm -hmm. And who's already had it? Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a lot more subtlety mm. to, the, to these models and complications. And watching, watching your special, I see them putting some fancy equations on the screen as eye candy that I don't really understand. Mm -hmm. Can you somehow give me an idea as to what levers and buttons are going into these models that aren't talked about when we do these basic things like who's got it, who hasn't got it, can we get this R0 number down? What's some of the more, for lack of a better word, to use a favourite word of yours, what's some of the more delicious mathematics that's going into <laughs> it? Like what what are these things I'm not seeing? Can you give me just like a taste of that? Yeah, totally. Okay, so on the standard SIR model, uh, you're assuming that the population is well mixed. Mm. And then there are other versions, like the Washington Post had a really nice example of where you essentially have, um, it's like particles in a box bumping into each other, yes. Yes. Uh, which is also really nice. But in reality, people don't, people are not uniformly mixed, you know, is, and we're not particles in a box bumping around into each other. So yeah. so one of the things that goes into these models is this is uh, social mixing. So it's how we're coming into contact with other people. And you can go into um, a lot of detail about that. You can you can take age categories and what age groups are mixing with what age groups. And then there's, you know, geographical uh, population densities and so on. All of that stuff can come into it. But I think mm. for me, the key thing, especially at the point we're at right now, Adam Kaczarski has got this really nice way of summarising it and he calls it the dots. It all comes down to these are the, the levers that you have to change the trajectory of a disease, of, a, of an outbreak. So D is the duration. So that is essentially how long you are infectious for. So O is opportunity. So that's how many people you come into contact with. Mm. T is the transmission probability. So when you're in contact with somebody, what are the chances, if you are infected, that you pass it on? And then S is the susceptibility. So um, how susceptible the population is. So the big ones, at the moment, you can't change duration. You can't change how long people are infectious for. Um, and we, there's very little to do with, you know, without a vaccine, there's very little that we can do apart from, you know, just letting everyone get it, which is, I think, you know, not, not an ideal solution. I mean, you can't do anything mm. about the, the susceptible, uh, how susceptible the population is. But opportunity mm. and transmission probability are the two things that you can change. These are things that you could, that are then quantified and can be put into the models. But so opportunity really is how many people you come into contact with. Mm. That's essentially why we're in lockdown. And then the transmission probability, that's where things like staying two metres away from someone, washing mm. down your uh, shopping as it comes in and, uh, you know, wearing masks, all of that kind of stuff comes in. But these things are then translated into a mathematical description and put into these models. So when the mathematicians play with these models and simulate things and come up with what they think is going on, how much subtlety can they then use in the the tools that they give to government like it seems a very blunt instrument at the moment it seems like all right now everyone's locked away now everyone can come out or now we're closing the schools or now we can't or this is how many hospital beds we need is there any more subtle advice that they can give to the government to sort of slightly tweak things or is it always this sort of black or white okay lock everyone up yeah okay now they can come out in june or july or whatever yeah i mean i think you're i think you you've hit the nail on the head really which is that this all comes down to the r naught, which ben sparks did a brilliant explanation of in in your number file video but essentially the number of people one person goes on to infect if it's above one the outbreak is growing and if it's below one it's 
it's declining. Yeah. And exactly as you said, if we we're in full lockdown, so at the moment, the current situation with the with the UK, the best estimate that I've seen for the current R naught is 0.62, which means that the outbreak is declining. We're not seeing that mm. in the data yet because there's an inevitable lag in the numbers. And if you don't do anything, if you don't have any social distancing, if you don't do anything at all, uh, it looks like the R naught of uh, of coronavirus is around two point five. So, mm. but between zero point six two lockdown, no one's allowed out of their houses apart from once a day, and two point five, there's quite a lot of room in terms of the numbers. And what you yeah. really want to do is you want to find something which allows people to have some sense of normality, but without letting this thing go out of control, really. I think there are still some people who want to stay in lockdown long enough until the disease goes away. And personally, I think that that is just going to be difficult. Um, right. I think it's going to be difficult in terms of, I don't think you can make this thing go away. Even on lockdown, there are enough people out, um, you know, uh, key workers and people flouting the rules too, let's be honest, where where I don't think you're going to get it to go away completely for a very, very long time. Yeah. And I think secondly, there are two ways that people can die here. I think people can die from the virus. And I also think that people can die from the lockdown. You know, there are cancer patients who've had their chemotherapy postponed. There was, during uh, Ebola in Sierra Leone, there was a massive spike in the number of maternal deaths just because women mm. were not accessing hospitals in the same way. And for every maternal death, there are numerous infant deaths that just won't be recorded in the same way. And I think that we could, if we try and stamp this thing out completely, 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 then I think that, you know, you can end up causing deaths in another way unintentionally. Lockdown itself is sort of deeply problematic. But I think the ideal, what you want to do is you want to slowly you know, release the lockdown bit by bit by bit. So you are never going up to that R0 of 2.5, but you're hopefully finding a kind of a middle ground. And that's essentially what they're trying to do in Sweden, right? So Sweden and Norway, I don't know if you've been following the story, but, you know, two countries right next to each other, they've got very different approaches. Norway's going for the shut it down, suppress it as much as you possibly can. And Sweden is going much more for the, let's definitely take steps. They've closed universities, they've banned gatherings of over 50 people. So they, they, it's not like they're not doing anything thing hmm. but they are trying to maintain as much of a sense of normality as they can while keeping the virus under uh, you know without letting it have completely uncontrolled spread does that mean they're going down this herd immunity route or is it more just they don't want people going out of their minds i don't know i just slightly have a problem with the herd immunity as though that, that characterization as though that's the objective hmm. i think that it's a consequence rather than the mm, the objective oh gosh <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll come. I'll come back to herd immunity in a moment because okay. I do. Okay. I, have, okay. I, okay. I do want to ask you about that. A question just popped into my head. Actually, you were talking about these kind of this other problem, these other deaths that can happen, these other consequences mm. as a result of lockdown. Are mathematicians modelling that too? I think that people are starting to look into it. Yeah, and the consequences yeah. of lockdown. It's really hard to do though because yeah. a death from coronavirus. Well, actually, although there is uncertainty around the death too, but you are more able to point at a death from coronavirus and say that the virus is what caused this death. Yeah. Whereas the consequences of lockdown, you know, I think austerity, for example, there's lots and lots of evidence that says that austerity was the direct cause, or indirect, I suppose, cause of, of n a huge number of deaths within the UK. And yeah. But they, you can't really... It's really hard to point at something and say poverty is the reason why this person died, despite the fact that poverty actually is is a cause of a huge number of deaths worldwide every single year. You know, if there's someone who right now has got, you know, a lump, perhaps, that they're a bit, you know, they've, they've noticed, but they're like, oh, I'll just wait until after the lockdown yeah. before going to see the doctor because it's going to be very difficult to get a doctor's appointment. I don't really want to go and, you know, visit a hospital, etc. at the moment. Yeah. And if they put that off by the time they get it seen to, actually it's too late. You know, that's definitely a consequence of lockdown, but it's really hard to point at it later down the line and say that's what yeah. caused it. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So these things are really difficult to quantify, but I think that there are really serious consequences of this. And I think that's even in a country like Britain, who is, you know, very wealthy, uh, comparatively to certain parts of the world, very well able to handle this stuff. I think when you think about places like South Africa, you know, locking down in South Africa, where... I, it's just, I think that there's really very, I mean, so they've they've actually cancelled the vaccination programme 
of uh, measles, uh, rubella. Uh, I think they've started cancelling polio as well in certain parts of Africa in response to trying to lock down for this virus. Hmm. And it's just like there are there are consequences to this stuff. It's not you know it, this isn't just a this isn't a choice of as some people are characterising it uh, lives versus money. It's really not like that. It's lives versus lives. So Hannah has now retired inside. She's left the home office because of heat and battery issues. So wish us luck. So I feel like like a lot of people at the moment have some degree of fear. People are a bit scared, which is quite completely mm. understandable. Do you feel like mathematicians, people who understand this at a different level, are more scared or less scared? Do you think you're more or less scared than Ooh. someone who has no real mathematical comprehension of how pandemics work? I think I was definitely more scared earlier. Hmm. Um, I think that the, yeah, I think that the, 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 the mathematical modelers and the immunologists and the virologists, I think that they had that period of like, oh, holy hell, hmm. in like January, February. But I also think that actually, broadly speaking, I think it's a bit easier to rationalise it. And, and to be honest, I certainly think for myself, I'm not concerned. I'm not really that concerned. David Spiegelhardt did a really brilliant piece of analysis where he looked at your risk of, of dying from the coronavirus hmm. and uh, essentially calculated that it was equivalent to your risk of dying over the next year. So it's like you have one year's worth of risk in one go right. in, in a couple of weeks, you know, across the course of two or three weeks. So that means that if you're very young... You know, if you are, would not be concerned about dying over the course of the next year, then you don't particularly need to be concerned about dying over the course of, of, uh, of the virus if you get it. Mm. Of course, inevitably, as you go older, the, that risk increases. But I think they're not even there. The numbers are actually are perhaps less frightening, I think, than sometimes they come across in the media. Because, you know, for instance, if you're over 80 and therefore the highest risk group of this particular virus... Mm your chances of survival are still 85%, mm. which actually, I mean, it's not great. I mean, you wouldn't choose it, but 85% is still good, solid yeah. odds, you know, at, at sort of beating it. Yeah. And so I think that, I mean, that doesn't, it'd probably be a horrible experience. I'm, I'm sure that, that for every person who very sadly dies from this thing, there are numerous other people who have a very, very horrible time of it. Yeah. But I think that having those sort of mathematical skills enables you to put those numbers in slightly more context. Well, you you lead nicely into my next question then, because... You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I often hear mathematicians bemoan the lack of mathematical literacy in society. Mm. And even during this pandemic, you've heard it, oh, if only people understood exponentials better and things like that, they'd realise how serious this is and whatnot. And I wonder whether or not you think if society was more mathematically literate that would necessarily be a really good thing at the moment because I wonder if they could gauge the risks and understood the numbers better, they might be a bit more cavalier with their social distancing and their lockdowns and their quarantines because they would they would see things differently. It would be a more considered risk. Whereas at the moment, yeah. if you're living in this like irrational fear, at least you're going to stay inside and help the cause. Yeah, I mean, that's true. And in some ways, the sort of the fear is useful in that it makes people pay attention to the rules. But then I also think that actually that fear has a real downside as well. I don't know if you've been following this sort of 5G stuff. Oh, yeah. So there's someone who I know very well and very close to who has bought into the 5G stuff right. to my endless frustration for people who don't know this is this weird conspiracy theory that yeah. 5g networks are somehow contributing to the problem or causing the problem or yeah it's like a government conspiracy i mean i don't totally understand all of it yeah. but i think it's something to do with fascism and something to do with david ike not sure right um <laughs> bit dismissive yeah yeah but but i think Gosh, I just think in a way, I think I understand why people are turning to that in so in in such numbers. Because I think that I think that the real truth of this is really scary, right? This is this is a random act of nature that no one can do anything about. And I think to believe in a conspiracy theory gives you someone to blame. It gives you a person that you can point to and it lets you believe that humans are still in charge, that we're not just part of this, this you know, this natural world and, and the consequences of which we have to sort of 
um, uh, stomach at some point or another. And I think, I, so in a way, I think that the, although I take your point about if people had more mathematical literacy, maybe they wouldn't be so scared. But then I think if people weren't so scared, they wouldn't also believe yeah. in this really dangerous stuff that actually has the same consequence, right? That people are breaking the lockdown as a result of it to go and burn 5G towers. So, I don't know. I've also, actually, I've got to be honest with you, I've been super impressed with the public. I mean, on Twitter and on Instagram and stuff, every day you've got people arguing about the difference between linear and, and log gra- like log axes. No, I, I, just don't, br- I really like that. Don't start me on that. <laughs> By the way, just for the sake of clarity, as the maker of number five, I'm not advocating like uh, mathematical ignorance in society as a useful tool. I just... Uh, no, I, you've <laughs> sort of done more to go against mathematical <laughs> ignorance in society than pretty much anyone on earth, Brady. So I think it would be a strange position for you to take. <laughs> All right, seeing you brought it up, I think these graphs, with log scales on the y-axis are bad. Oh, okay. Go on. I think that I think they lull people into a false sense of security when they see a nice gentle slope, not realizing what they're actually looking at is this god awful exponential curve that's shooting up into the sky like the red arrows. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. That is interesting. Mm. So you. Oh, okay. That's interesting. But the, okay. The thing is, is that you can't really tell what's going on on a linear. I know, graph, I know, right? and yeah, I know I mean, that's why you can't really do it. tell what's going on. And I know that's why you do it. And I know that's a useful tool for mathematicians and people who can look at that and, in a second, you know, transfer it Get in it. their head. But I think when you're printing them in newspapers and websites, and people are seeing Italy and America and the UK, and they've all got these very similar, just slightly differing diagonal slopes, people are thinking, "Oh, it's all the same everywhere, and it's all quite gentle." When in fact, what they're looking at is something that should be scaring the bejesus out of them but they're still seeing the numbers though i mean yeah. i think if somebody yeah. if somebody struggled to read a graph or, or let me rephrase that i think if somebody took a gentle slope on a log axis as though it was like oh it's nice and gentle surely they would also see the number a thousand a day which is where we are you know yeah. right now recording this i'm sure it'll be a different number by the time anyone listens to this but surely they'll see that number and realize that no this really is like very scary yeah Okay. I don't know. I guess that's, you know what we need to do? We need to do a study. We need to ask people. <laughs> I think there are higher priorities right now than a, but, but <laughs> let's save that one for later. Let me ask you about something else that I know you have some interest in, data and privacy. My, mm. my sister uh, lives in Singapore and she was telling me about what happens mm-hmm. there when someone, when they have problems. And th- what they can do there quite easily is if someone tests positive, they can look at what taxis they've caught who was who was sitting in that same taxi in the last two or three hours? They can contact those people and warn them and isolate those people. And having access to all this data lets them put out the fires very quickly. Obviously, mm. this rings massive alarm bells in everyone's heads, including mine, who are used to sort of this uh, mm-hmm. you know, data privacy issues. But it does seem like having more access to data does let you deal with pandemics better. Your 2018 film demonstrated that brilliantly. Although you anonymized everything and made a big point of saying you had, Mm. it did show that if you have this information, you can do all sorts of things. You can figure out who's spreading what, you can vaccinate those people, control those people. You You have a lot more weaponry to save lives. Where do you come down on this? What do you feel about this? You do. You do have a lot more weaponry. I think you just have to decide what kind of society you want to live in, really. Because, I, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right that China and, um, you know, South Korea and Singapore, in terms of the way that they've managed to deal with this virus, let me just put a little um, asterisk by deal with and come back to that in a moment, <laughs> but it's, it, it's completely different to what's happened in Europe, right? Like the, you know, the, the particularly Singapore and South Korea have managed to, to slow the rate of infection much quicker than we have within Europe. Yeah. And all of the sort of technological reasons um, that you mention are a really important part of that. I just think that we have to be careful when you make decisions that you are not making them in a quick response to an emergency, a decision that you will you will later regret. Mm. In this particular culture, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not one way or the other, right? Like, I, th- I can definitely, definitely see the real benefit of a centralised system right now where you know where people are and you know who's sick and those two pieces of information are joined up. Yeah. And the way that things are in Britain at the moment is that it's very difficult to connect those dots because no one really wants the government to tell 
a company like, you know, uh, Google or Facebook or whoever, who's sick. No one really is like up for that data being passed in that direction. And simultaneously, all the companies who have the data of where we are, I don't think people particularly want the government to know where we all are at any point in time either. Yep. So it's like in, on, in both directions, no one really wants that flow of information, which is why the the apps that are being explored now work on Bluetooth rather than on uh, GPS. They work on your proximity to other devices rather than necessarily um, exactly where you are, just to try and help get around a few of those privacy issues. Yeah. But the thing is, is that it, I think in this urgency to uh, try and save people's lives, because I mean, that's ultimately what we're talking about here. I can just see that slight knee-jerk reactions, which we come to regret later. And I think that we just need to be careful about that. I mean, I think we've seen that in Hungary a bit, actually, in a more political way of uh, people using uh, the situation to make sensible decisions for the situation, but actually that uh, will be difficult to be reversed later. But I also actually want to go back to that sort of, uh, the fact that Singapore and South Korea have been able to deal with this virus. Mm. You know, Singapore have locked down again, right? So ultimately, what all of this technology has enabled them to do is to elongate the gap between their lockdowns. It hasn't got rid of the virus altogether. And they've done all kinds of incredible things, you know, including quarantining anyone who comes into the country for two weeks, you know, mass testing, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of really clever stuff. And they still haven't been able to fight the tide of this thing coming in. And I think that that really is a, there's a difficult lesson in there. Hannah, talking to you about your research, you know, a few times over the years, because even your normal research often deals with taking humans and groups and society and attaching numbers and Mm. graphs to thing and then analyzing it and obviously we've seen a lot of that happening over the last few weeks with the uh, the pandemic Mm. i always wonder how much dehumanizing people and turning them into numbers and graphs is that a really good way to be making decisions because it takes like it makes your decisions more rational and less emotional or is that a really bad way to make decisions because it, it takes away that constant thought that these are humans with lives and loved ones and families. We saw this, obviously, when the the whole herd immunity thing came up, Mm. you know, just treating people like, okay, if we let this percentage of people get it, this could be good, forgetting that you're kind of getting, people will be sick and dying as a result of it. Yeah, there's people's mums and dads and daughters and brothers and sisters that are dying. Yeah, yeah, I agree. How do you reconcile this? Because part of you has to make decisions for the good of the many and treat it mathematically. But part of you has to be like, you know, a compassionate human. You know, I mean, in a way you are you're like describing one of the sort of deep philosophical arguments, right? This sort of like Bentham's like utilitarianism and all of that. That's essentially what you're describing in a way. I mean, I think that actually, I think it's not one or the other. It can be both a good thing and a bad thing to think of people as numbers on a page. I think that you, in some ways, actually being able to be removed in a kind of and look at things statistically. I think that does allow you to to see the uh, to see the rationale of different decisions in a clearer light. I think that's that's one thing. I think if you um, yeah, being that being unemotional, I think allows you to compare different interventions in a better way um, or in a clearer way. But I also think that if you totally and completely rely on the lum- numbers, then you're forgetting that we are human, um, which you know has been one of my big arguments for the last sort of that's you know my last book was essentially all about that like you cannot throw away the fact that we're human when you think of us in a mathematical way Mm. but I also think that what it does do is it puts too much faith in the mathematical models because these things they're not crystal balls right they're not they're not telling us what the future is going to look like there is all kinds of uncertainty wrapped around them and I think that you have to be careful when you are creating mathematical models not to dismiss them as junk but also not to think that they are these magical things that allow you to peer into the future. You have to, they have to be part of a, of a, a suite of evidence that allows you to get f- towards the, the best decision possible. Hannah, throughout your Contagion special on BBC back in 2018, there was this number emblazoned on the screen several times. It was like this magic number of the number of people mm. that would die in the UK if we had a really mm. bad pandemic. This was two years ago. Yeah. It was based on the modelling you'd all done. It was 886,877. <laughs> I wrote it down because it was on the screen so many times. Mm. What do you think about that number now? I really don't know. I mean, I think that the number is going to be smaller, right? It will definitely be smaller than that. Right. So this, I think, is a perfect illustration of what I mean about the uncertainty around the numbers, Yeah. around like the mathematical, the, what the maths say. Because um, 
the estimates for the fatality rate of um, this virus, they vary wildly. Yeah. And it depends on the situation which you look at. So if you look at the cruise ship, for example, where I think the fatality rate there was about 1% or so, yeah. you could take that as though it was a fact. And in many ways, actually, um, the numbers that have been thrown around in the paper, uh, the papers, are sort of based on around that idea that uh, a certain percentage of the, the British population will get it and around 1% of those will die. So if we didn't, if we did nothing, 500,000 is the number that has been, um, mm. that has been calculated and quoted widely. Yeah. But the thing is, is that the cruise ship actually had a population that skewed much older. And we already know that older people tend to be more at risk from this virus than others. There's also, you know, so, so evidence from other places are that, that perhaps this number can be a bit lower. But until we have the testing, until we know what the real denominator is, until we know how many people have this virus and aren't symptomatic, how many people have had this virus and didn't even know that they had the virus... Um, we really don't know what that real number is. We really don't know what the real fatality rate is, um, which is why testing is so incredibly important. But I think that, I don't know. I mean, I think that I really, really hope that we get better at something, slow this down enough that a vaccine comes along or that something else uh, comes in and, uh, yeah, helps us to minimise the, the, the number of deaths as, as far as possible. I know you've just recently recorded sort of another another thing with the BBC. I don't know if it's a sequel or a follow-up. Mm. Making this sequel about two years later, almost exactly two years later, actually, now I think about it, yeah. just, just, yeah, just it over. Is. What's different? What did you learn or how has your thinking changed from when you were doing it as a, this is going to happen one day, slightly jolly special to kind of making something in the middle of it like what's different beyond the obvious yeah (laughs) Yeah. well okay so when I filmed that first one I became certainly for a a period of time I became very cautious about germs (laughs) so there was one occasion when my mum and dad had flu and uh, I had a big project coming up and I really did not want to get sick and I also had a um, had a baby in the house So I, yeah, my mum and dad wanted to come to my house. They were like driving past and they wanted to come to my house and drop off something. Mm. And I made them, (laughs) um, I made them post it through the letterbox and I wouldn't let them in my house. And this was two years ago. This is two years ago from the (laughs) upstairs window. I like opened the upstairs window and was like, hi, like, (laughs) (laughs) thanks for dropping off the letter. Go away now. (laughs) I mean, that's just standard procedure now. That's exactly, that is standard procedure now. That is standard yeah. procedure. Yeah. So um, in a lot of ways, I think that like I, uh, not that much has changed. So it, yeah, I, I think that the first program had a similar effect on me. Yeah. But I just, yeah, perhaps didn't realise it would come this quickly. From talking to you, you know, obviously this is all anyone talks about. I've spoken to you today and spoke to you the other day just on the phone. It, I get this feeling that you you have this respect and awe for this virus and for pandemics that not everyone quite has. You feel like, despite the fact it's all pervading and it's changed the world so much, you feel like people still aren't quite getting it. They don't get it. Mm. I don't want to depress everyone. <laughs> okay. I don't want to depress anyone, but I think that for a while now, I have thought that this virus will become just another one of the coronaviruses that regularly circulates the seasonal virus you know like cold and flu yeah which essentially means that everyone will get it at some point and i haven't changed my mind on that but that means that this is not something that's going away in the next three weeks or four weeks or two months will there be a mathematical legacy to all of this i don't know Maybe we'll just fade back into obscurity. <laughs> but I think, you know, a lot of ways, actually, I think that mathematicians are probably going to come into a lot of blame for all of this. I think we're sort of in a position where we can't really win because I think that it's the mathematical models that are driving the decisions as to when we lock down and when we don't lock down. Mm. And if everything goes well, if the lockdowns go well and we save a lot of lives, then I think that people will start to wonder whether the mathematical models were right and whether we needed to lock down in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And then if the lockdowns don't work, then I think people will accuse the mathematical models of being wrong and that we needed to do more. And I don't know if I don't know if at the end of this anyone's going to step back and say, wow, thank goodness we had those mathematical models, even though I really, really am grateful we've got those mathematical models. I will. 
I'll thank you. You will. Thank you, Brady. Our thanks to Hannah for joining us today. I'm going to include links to her stuff and some of what she was talking about in the notes for this podcast. Also thanks to the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute for its support of Number Far. And finally, thanks to our patrons. You make it possible for us to keep making as many videos and podcasts as we do. You can find a list of current patrons on the Number Far website. You can even join them yourself by contributing at patreon.com slash numberfile. I'm Brady Harron and we'll catch you again soon.